with exercise, part of the magic is that you now have activated, if you will, an insulin independent mechanism of controlling glucose. So the muscle that we have is responsible for consuming up to, if not more than 80% of all the glucose when we've eaten a meal. So if someone goes and eats a hamburger and fries, you would see that their glucose levels would climb. And as, as the glucose starts to come back down, almost all of that drop in glucose in the blood is because the muscles have started pulling in that glucose and insulin stimulates that glucose uptake in a, in a typical setting of we, we're eating and we're just lounging around now after the meal. But in contrast, when you are physically active and you've, you've engaged that, that, that contraction and relaxation of muscles, um, now the muscle fibers have an insulin independent mechanism uh, to pull in the glucose. Basically, those same doors that would have only been opening when insulin would come and knock on them now open on their own because the muscle is basically mm -hmm. demanding it. It's, it's essentially telling the body, my need for energy right now is so great that I am not going to wait for insulin to tell me to pull in that glucose. I'm just going to do it. But part of the so, so that's that's a, a benefit there. You are lowering your glucose, and that means insulin can come down. And keeping insulin low is the key to maintaining insulin sensitivity and reducing the risk of all the diseases that come with insulin resistance. It's also the key to being lean. And if I may be so bold, it's the key to longevity, but that's a bit of a tangent. But but nevertheless, you you, you exercise, you work the muscle. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you're working that muscle, in, uh, glucose will come down and insulin will come down. People that are insulin resistant would naturally have a higher level of insulin. Their kind of baseline insulin is a little higher. Uh, so they're sort of chronically, maybe even multiples higher, two or three or four times higher than, than the average insulin sensitive person. But that's kind of at the moment, they're, they're normal. And so if insulin comes down for them, uh, their fasting insulin may be at 20, but an insulin sensitive person's fasting insulin may be at five. In that person who's insulin resistant, that 20 level is, is kind of normal at the moment. And because their muscles are insulin resistant, that 20 is, is going to be okay. They're not going to, you know, force themselves into a hypoglycemic um, event when they exercise. So them having a chronically higher insulin, uh, because they're insulin resistant, it'll still be higher during exercise, but also because of the insulin resistance, that will ensure they don't become hypoglycemic. However, over time, in the wake of that exercise session, they've become a little more insulin sensitive. They do it again, they become a little more insulin sensitive. And so slowly, actually not so slowly in some instances, it can be profoundly quick within just you know weeks, in fact. Um, their insulin will start to come down. Now, importantly, as we are kind of converging these topics with insulin sensitivity and exercise, a study in humans found that when uh, you took insulin resistant people and they exercised, if they finished their exercise with a carbohydrate rich insulin spiking meal, they mitigated the insulin sensitizing effects of the exercise session. That is such a note of caution because as we see in gyms so often, you'll see some person who's likely insulin resistant on that elliptical machine, and they're just working their guts out, but then they're sipping like a fruit smoothie mm -hmm. or some other kind of nonsense. Don't finish your workout with carbs or feel like you need to even be eating the carbs during the workout. It literally affects every cell in the body. Every cell in the body has things called insulin receptors, which are these very specific doors, if you will, on the surface of every cell from from bone to brain, from lungs to liver, they, that where, where insulin can come and knock on that door and basically tell the cell to do something. That, that's the, and one of its main actions, the one it's most famous for, is that it will lower blood glucose levels. When, when we eat something starchy or sugary, blood glucose levels will start to climb. If glucose stays too high for too long, that's actually dangerous, even lethal. And so insulin's a savior in that sense. It will come to certain cells on the body, especially muscle cells, knock on the door of the muscle cells, open doors for glucose to come rushing in out of the blood into the muscle, giving the muscle some energy and other tissues, other cell types as well. So that's a general overview of what insulin itself is. And then insulin resistance is really this, 
this it's two sides of a coin and, and not a good one, unfortunately. Uh, so this is where someone has some cells of the body that for various reasons have stopped responding well to insulin. The muscle cells can become insulin resistant. And now when insulin comes and attempts to knock on the door to allow the glucose to come in, the muscle cell isn't responding. It's ignoring the knock, so to speak. And so the glucose levels will stay higher. That's one example of, of a cell that's becoming insulin resistant, but not all cells become insulin resistant. And that is where the other half, the other side of the coin becomes relevant because the other feature of insulin resistance, the first being again, that some cells aren't responding. The other feature is that insulin levels themselves are elevated. So they're, they're chronically up. So someone's living a life where every moment is spent with insulin being several times higher than, than, than it should have been, than it used to be when they were more insulin sensitive. And that becomes a problem because there are many cells in the body that are still responsive to insulin. And now insulin is overstimulating them. Insulin is working too well at those cells. And one interesting example is the, the theca cells of the ovaries. They are very busily converting testosterone into the estrogens, the prototypical female sex hormones. And that's the little known fact. All estrogens what? in men, in, yeah, all estrogens in men or women used to be testosterone. So in men or women, um, the, the part of the job of the testes in the ovaries is converting testosterone into wow. estrogens. It's just that ovaries do it, of course, a lot more. And ovaries do it through the actions of an enzyme called aromatase. Now, these cells in the ovaries called theca cells, they maintain their sensitivity to insulin. And so now insulin is too high and, and, and it's over uh, it's overactive at the theca cells. One of the consequence here is that insulin actually inhibits that conversion from testosterone into the estrogens. And so now you have a woman with with this elevated insulin, which is insulin resistance. And now her ovaries are not producing the big estrogen spikes that she needs for a normal fertile menstrual cycle. And now the ovaries just start producing a lot of follicles and never one ovulating. And so the ovaries get really big and those little follicles become cysts. And now she has polycystic ovary syndrome, what? which is at its core, a, a disease of too much insulin, even in ladies that are lean. And you wouldn't think, oh, well, they're insulin resistant. They might not fit the profile um, in, in that they might be, they look like their normal weight, but even in normal weight women with PCOS, their fat cells have still become insulin resistant. And that is pushing this insulin resistance to the, uh, or elevating the insulin. And that's then uh, compromising the function of the ovaries. Insulin resistance is this two, it's, it's a combination of two variables. One, some cells aren't responding to insulin. And two, insulin itself is much higher than it should have been. And the two of those together are really acting together. That really is what explains why insulin resistance is so relevant. Most people would just think if they know anything about insulin resistance, they would think, oh, it's just relevant to diabetes of some kind. But the truth is, as I certainly um, elaborate on in the book at, at book length, is that these two variables of insulin resistance really explain how insulin resistance is a fundamental cause of virtually every chronic disease. And if it's not causing the chronic disease, uh, it's making it worse. What is you know, what, what's relevant about that statistic that, you know, almost nine in 10 adults are metabolically unfit. We kind of take that one deeper level and I don't think it's too much of an assumption to then say, well, that might mean nine in 10 adults is, is insulin resistant. And un unfortunately, because of how we view the disease, which I won't elaborate on yet because uh, that, that is a different topic, but we, we don't diagnose the insulin resistance. We diagnose the manifestation of the insulin resistance. We tell the woman, you have PCOS. We tell the man, uh, you have hypertension. Um, you have fatty liver disease. Um, whatever it is, all of these disorders that, that the average um, clinician or the average clinical visit wouldn't imagine has a common core but they do, and, and I certainly go into detail in the book, and that's one of the points of the book, it is to emphasize that there is a common cause of most diseases, and, and that's a good thing because then we can treat one thing. We don't have yeah. to give them a drug that's treating the symptom, which is really all a drug can ever do. A drug can never cure a disease. It can only ever treat symptoms. And so there's, I think there's something kind of liberating about this perspective that there is, and I'm not saying insulin resistance is the sole cause of chronic disease, not at all. I'm not so bold or naive to say that, but it is definitely a big part. And that should be good news because that is something, that is one single point of attack that we can address. And, and so then rather than this, 
So you imagine a typical overweight Canadian or American, and he opens up his medicine cabinet. He has to take his anti-diabetic drug, his anti-hypertensive um, drug to control his blood pressure, and and you know maybe one more for his erectile dysfunction. And then realize, I mean, imagine how liberating it is to realize, wait a minute, I can get rid of all those medications, which are simply all um, manifest, addressing symptoms of one common problem, insulin resistance. And so to your question, uh, what about the solution? In fact, the solution for reversing insulin resistance is the same for preventing it. So I can kind of address both of those issues in one. And, and I believe firmly the most effective rapid way of reversing insulin resistance is to lower the insulin, change a person's eating habits to bring the insulin down. And now all of a sudden the body becomes more insulin sensitive. And the lower insulin itself, those two events together, we have removed the insulin resistance and all those, all those surrogate or, or derivative problems begin to resolve the person's blood. In fact, blood pressure is so intimately a result of, of insulin resistance that within days of someone changing their diet to lower their insulin, they have to get off their antihypertensive medications because they start fainting. Their blood pressure has gone so low so quickly. And the same thing within weeks of anti-diabetic drugs, like Dr. Jason Fung has shown, within just a few weeks of a, ch of a person changing their diet, they have to stop taking their insulin injections for a type 2 diabetic because th they don't need it anymore. Their, their glucose is going too low. So it is a, it, it's a phenomenal, it, it's a liberating, I use that word too often, it, it, it's, but it is. It, it should be looked at as very good news where someone can say, I can, I can save money. I can save on the side effects of these medications. I don't like how they make me feel. I don't like taking them. Well, the good news is the gospel of this uh, is that you can change, you can change it. The food you eat is either the culprit or the cure. And again, if you look at it as a cure, you look at it through the lens of what uh, will this keep my insulin low? And that is why the default then, if we, if someone listening to this would say, okay, great, Ben, well, how do I do that? The solution is simple. It really is as simple as control your carbohydrates, avoid those foods that are spiking your insulin, which are refined starches, um, you know, and sugars, which are abundant. They're, they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere nowadays, whether it's Serbia or Singapore or Canada or anywhere else, they're everywhere. And the sooner we start controlling carbohydrates, focusing on the least starchy and the least sugary foods, then the sooner insulin can come down. And now the body starts to almost seemingly miraculously uh, heal itself, but it has to start with controlling carbohydrates. And then, of course, the person would think, well, what do I eat then? If I can't eat bread and bagels and cereal, then focus on protein and fat. Those are not only essential, there are such things as essential fats and essential amino acids, while there, as you know, better than most, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. But I'm not saying don't eat any carbs. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but focus on the foods that we actually need proteins and fats, and coincidentally have little to no effect on insulin. So someone can eat a big juicy steak and their insulin will barely have a hiccup. I will actually go on kind of a water carnivore week to just check those addictions, to put, the, to put them in their place. And when I'm measuring my glucose on my, on my continuous glucose monitor, it is a flat line literally the whole time. The first would be stress. Uh, so the, the the primary or the prototypical oh. stress hormones like cortisol and epinephrine, those are directly antagonistic to insulin and cortisol in particular. So someone who's had to take like a, a common course of treatment, for example, for rheumatoid arthritis or any type of arthritis might be um, a cortisol analog like a yeah, prednisone or a dexamethasone. And those will cause the body to become insulin resistant very quickly. And then the insulin is going up mm -hmm. and now the fat cells are holding on to energy more. And you've had Jason Fung on previously. So this is something he's very much um, eloquent and elaborated on well in the past. Uh, so that's why the person taking these anti-inflammatory steroids, they are cortisol like molecules. They cause the body to become insulin resistant. And then all the consequences that come from that. 
inflammation is a distinct cause of insulin resistance on its own. And so, in fact, let's mention rheumatoid arthritis again. That's an autoimmune disease. And like most autoimmune diseases, it will have active and passive phases. You know, the person, their joints are really bad for a couple of days. Now they're all right now. They're really bad. And that's very likely because of an environmental exposure, as yeah. you would know better than most. M many autoimmunities are triggered because of something in the environment, something they're ingesting in, in some way, shape, or form. So with, auto with rheumatoid arthritis, it's interesting to note that when someone is in an active phase of the, of the disease and they have higher inflammation, higher joint pain, you can detect an increase in insulin resistance that ebbs and flows as the disease is more or less active. So you can so measure that? You can, yeah. Wow. There's a study that's been done in humans to show that. Yeah. So that's the second one. Inflammation is a cause of insulin resistance. And then lastly, the one that I believe is, is the most relevant in a long-term situation is too much insulin itself. Now, someone, the astute listener would uh, remember from just a few minutes ago, well, wait, Ben, you just got done saying that elevated insulin is a feature of insulin resistance. It is. It's also a cause. And, and we see this in laboratory settings, including from my own lab, but in humans even, if someone has chronically elevated insulin, the body stops responding to the insulin. So too much insulin is a cause of insulin resistance. Now, some people balk at that um, explanation, but it really is fundamental of, of just biology. Too much of a stimulus will result in a resistance to that stimulus, whether it is a hormone, whether it is a, an antibiotic, whether it is a, a, a drug, whether taken for medicinal purposes or abused, the person will need more and more of that drug to get the same response that they used to get from a, le a smaller amount. So insulin is no exception. When a stimulus is incessant at a cell, the cell will start to turn down its sensitivity to that signal. And so too much insulin is one of the primary causes of insulin resistance. And then the, the last one that I just, I need to mention is more of a secondary because I can't induce insulin resistance, for example, on cells uh, by directly treating the cells with this molecule. But that would be the omega-6 um, polyunsaturated fatty acid, linoleic acid. So the fat that is abundant in, in uh, th these artificial seed oils. Uh, like soybean oil or, or you know, in Canada, you, in Alberta, you always see these canola fields. Canola oil is 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 the same. It's these in, these really, I guess, industrial seed oils that 100 years ago had no place in our diet. And they are more of an indirect effect because they make the fat cells become insulin resistant. And when the fat cells become insulin resistant, they're typically the first domino to fall. And I won't elaborate more beyond that, lest I get off on a whole other topic. But insulin resistance is sort of this process of one tissue falling, like it would be the first domino. And I believe it's the fat cells that become insulin resistant first. And in so doing, they then start bumping into other tissues like muscle, liver, brain, et cetera. I am a huge advocate of ruminant um, animal consumption, of ruminant animal products in the human diet. There's something just beautiful. It's elegant. It's intelligent that this is an animal that can eat a food that nothing, that we cannot we cannot eat those grasses uh, at all. Uh, so this whole kind of vegan myth that we can eat like a, an ape does, we can eat like a, a cow does. No, we cannot. We cannot thrive on that kind of diet. So to, to, to be able to ha have an animal that can take a plant like grass, which is directly getting energy from the sun, um, and then captures that energy, harnesses it, and because of its miraculous um, stomachs, can form all the foods it needs, and then we as apex predators can then come in and eat that animal that can't eat any of the other grains and plants that we might want to enjoy. They're not supposed to eat those. They're supposed to eat the plants that we cannot eat. And thank heavens for that. I think there's something yes. beautiful about it. Really, my central thesis um, in the book, in a way, is we need to put insulin on the radar, including measuring it clinically. Measure your insulin. As someone who's hearing this and is about to have a clinical visit, do what you can. Beg, plead, whatever to get your insulin measured. Um, and if it's below six microunits per mil or, or around 30, 35 picomolar, then that's a good sign and you're doing great. A second measurement is actually looking at your blood lipids. And this one's a little more accessible because we always were so obsessed with blood lipids, which, uh, which is fine. I don't think that's unwarranted. But that means someone will always have their triglyceride number and their HDL number, the HDL cholesterol. 
And so the sort of poor man's method, a surrogate of getting a feel for what your insulin sensitivity status is, take your triglyceride number and divide it by your HDL cholesterol number. And if that ratio, triglycerides to HDL cholesterol, is 1.5 or less, that's a good sign. That's a person who's insulin sensitive in general. So th to sum it up, get your insulin measured. And if you can't get your insulin measured due to insurance constraints or medical system constraints, then focus on your triglyceride to HDL ratio. You will always get that measured no matter where you are. And if it's less than 1.5, then that's a green light. You're doing all right. So metabolic syndrome, as I mentioned, is a constellation of five disorders. And over the years, there have been a few kind of rolling definitions of it, but the consensus has settled on these five. Let's see if I can rattle them off. One is elevated blood pressure, so hypertension. Second, elevated glucose levels. Third, elevated waist circumference, so central obesity or adiposity. And then the fourth and fifth are kind of related, which is just sort of bad blood lipids. And specifically, they break mm -hmm. them up into two, elevated triglycerides and low HDL. When we look at it as insulin resistance syndrome, now we understand the origins of these problems. If someone is insulin resistant, they will have elevated triglycerides. They will have lower HDL. If they're insulin resistant, they will have higher glucose and higher blood pressure. And the central obesity can both be cause and consequence of the insulin resistance itself. But altogether, those constellation of disorders it is it are much more derivative or more accurately described as consequences of insulin resistance rather than just a vague, uh, you're not metabolically fit. A physician gets paid to see patients. That's the job of, of the physician. I'm a scientist. Uh, I get paid to ask questions. Now, I don't get paid as well. It's not as lucrative to be curious um, as seeing patients, but that does mean I can sit back and say, how does hypertension um, have a metabolic origin? Why is it part of the metabolic syndrome? Oh, it's because of the insulin doing this and doing that. Um, throughout the body, at blood vessels, at the adrenal glands, it's affecting the way the body's behaving with regards to its blood volume and blood pressure. And so th that's, I know that. And so my greatest, my most favorite um, audience is actually when I get to go give talks at clinics about these kinds of things. I love speaking to nurses and doctors and hospital administrators with no ego. It is not my ego that drives that interest. It's because there's a genuine delight on my part to think this is the way it ought to be. There ought to be the scientists in the lab, the boring yeah. kind of their version of white coats, finding answers to questions. They convey those answers to the actual practitioners who are on the front lines doing, doing all kinds of, you know, wonderful things, but they, they don't get paid to sit back and kick up their feet in their desk, look out their window and ask themselves these questions. I certainly feel frustration in my own right with how people look at type 2 diabetes. Yeah. And, and where the, the average clinician will look at type 2 diabetes as completely a glucose problem. And they'll say, your glucose is too high. And they won't have any awareness of insulin. Insulin's not even on their radar. Um, but the tragedy in this situation is as someone's oh. developing insulin resistance, as the audience now knows, their insulin is high. But the insulin is enough. There's enough function of the insulin that it's able to keep the glucose at normal. And so the patients coming in, they get diagnosed with PCOS or, or, or hypertension or fatty liver disease, and they're not even looking at the insulin. If they did, they'd see that it's much higher. It's only years later that now the body's become so resistant to its insulin that now the glucose starts to climb. Wow. And then they detect the problem. And they say, ah, well, you have type 2 diabetes now. And the tragedy doesn't end there. But that's the first tragedy is that by looking at type 2 diabetes as a glucose disease, we detect it too late, potentially decades later. If we'd looked at it as an insulin disease, we would detect it much, much sooner. And... Second, if we looked at it as an insulin disease, we would treat it better because the tragedy in type 2 diabetes is the type 2 diabetic has very high insulin and very high glucose. But because we look at it as a glucose disease, the physician will say, well, let's just give you more insulin. Let's put you on insulin therapy or give you drugs that will push up your insulin. And they might not even know what the insulin is, but it works to lower the glucose. 
And so if this were just a glucose disease, we would say, well, we've solved the problem. But the reality is when we give a type 2 diabetic insulin and they already have high insulin, which they always do in type 2 diabetes, then we make them fatter and sicker and we kill them faster. Their risk of dying from heart disease triples. Their risk of dying from cancer doubles. Their risk of getting Alzheimer's doubles. We are killing them by giving them insulin. But kind of to your point, the cynical view that I somewhat share, conventional medicine would just say, you can continue to eat high carbohydrate yeah. diets. In fact, eat every two hours. Just make sure you cover it with insulin. That is an asinine perspective. It is killing patients when we put a type 2 diabetic on insulin and tell them to eat what they want and just cover it with insulin, it's a wonderful way to sell more insulin, but it's a terrible way to help a patient get better. If we look at it as an insulin-centric or through an insulin-centric paradigm, then we say, all right, you have chronically high insulin. How can we lower your insulin? You know what? Eat less carbs. You don't have to go zero carb to do this. Just eat less carbs. We published a paper, a clinical case study with a, a clinic here in my area, and we took 11 middle-aged women with type 2 diabetes, full-on type 2 diabetes, and we put them on a, a – they had an option. When they were in that clinical visit, having just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, the option was you leave with a drug prescription – the consequence of which will be that you have to continue to take that drug forever and you'll likely have higher and higher doses of it. Or you have a, a, a nutritional prescription, if you will, and it's going to be the, the simple rules that I outlined earlier, control carbs, focus on protein and fat. And within 90 days, these 11 women but were part of the case study. They elected to follow the low-carb, even ketogenic diet. And within 90 days, they had nary a whiff of diabetes. Their glucose was totally normal. Mm. They had lost 20 pounds. Their blood pressure had come down by any definition of the disease, we we had cured it, which is a term you're not supposed to use with type 2 diabetes. You're not supposed to say you cure it because if you just use drugs to solve the problem, well, you never will. You will never cure it. The great myth of weight gain or weight loss is you have some 20-year-old, um, you know, dude who's bragging about, you know, I, I, of course, I'm, I have them all over here because I'm a university professor. He's bragging about how he can eat whatever he wants because he has such a high metabolic rate. Or you have people like who were older out of school. Oh, I gained 10 pounds or I gained 20 or 30 pounds. Once I got married or once I had a baby, my metabolism just really slowed down. All of that is totally false. There's nothing to support that um, perspective at all. In fact, with pregnancy in mind, a part of the great uh, it blows that myth apart quite quite well because the moment a woman becomes pregnant, over the next nine months, her metabolic rate is going to get faster and faster and faster because metabolic rate is just the sum of all the chemical reactions happening in the body, building things up and breaking them down. Anabolic and catabolic, that is metabolic or metabolism or metabolic rate. And, and so metabolic rate does not predict weight gain. In fact, there was a study someone, anyone could look up called the Baltimore Longitudinal Study. And they basically followed a bunch of, a bunch of guys, about a thousand people for 10 years. And they measured metabolic rate at year zero. And at year 10 follow-up, what their baseline metabolic rate had been at year zero in no way predicted who gained or lost weight the most or the least in any, to any degree. However, in that same study, there is an ounce of explanation for what might have predicted their weight gain or, or what might have been responsible for it. And they looked at something called the respiratory exchange ratio. The RER is a measurement of what fuel we're burning. Now, very briefly, human metabolism is like a hybrid where at any moment, the overwhelming majority of all the energy our cells are getting is coming from a mix of of glucose or fat. So blood sugar or fat, that's the main fuel. And it, it, it's a mix at all the time. We're never burning just one or just the other. All the cells in the body are using these two fuels and shifting between them as needed, maybe because they've eaten or because they fasted. But basically, the RER will tell you, are you more sugar burning or are you more fat burning? What they found was that the people that were more sugar burning, that, that glucose was responsible for the majority of the fuel their body was using, they were the ones who gained the most weight. In contrast, the people that were mm -hmm. more fat burning, they gained the least amount of weight. They were the more likely to stay lean. So someone hearing this would say, okay, well, I don't want to be a sugar burner then because then my chances of gaining weight over the next years is going to be higher. Yes, that study would suggest that's true. Then the core, the follow-up would be, well, how do I then become a fat burner? You burn what you eat.
And pr unfortunately, because we are such a carb obsessed culture, the world is obsessed with carbohydrates. No one is sitting around on a Saturday night about to indulge in some, in some shows, some TV shows or movies. And they're thinking, oh, I sure want to play the scrambled eggs. No, no. One. Okay. Just to interrupt. I watched the jungle book with Scarlett last night Yeah, and we had chicken wings. Did, ah, just chicken wings, chicken wings and salt. So super crispy, but in our popcorn bowl. So there Good are some you. people who are doing that, yeah, but yeah, it's fairly rare. <laughs> because we are craving something that is salty and crunchy or sweet and gooey. And that is always, almost always going to be carbohydrate. Now you actually found a clever way around it by just crispy crisping chicken. The wings. chicken. Yeah. 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 So that worked. And unfortunately, because we're obsessed with carbohydrates and we eat every two hours, we are constantly in sugar burning mode. And it's only once we lower the carbs and or fast do we shift over to fat burning mode where we can we can shift between these fuels. And once again, insulin rears its relevant head in even in this process, because insulin as it this hormone is what dictates which fuel we're using. If insulin is elevated, we uh -huh. are oblig obligatorily burning glucose. We're sugar burning. If insulin is low, we shift and we start fat burning. In fact, if insulin is low for an extended period of time, like 16 to 20 hours, we start burning so much fat that we actually are burning more fat than we need, so to speak. And some of that fat gets metabolized into ketones. It's called ketogenic really because it's burning fat like gangbusters. It's just tearing through the fat in the body. It's burning it at such a high rate, we start making ketones from it. If you're fat burning, it's easier to control your weight because it, those fat cells are not filled with glucose. They're filled with fat. And it's only once we start burning fat can we actually start to control our body fat. If we're stuck burning sugar all the time, those fat cells are never touched in a, in a general way, in a generic sense. And thus they just keep pulling in energy never actually using it because we aren't burning fat. Why might someone be gaining weight more easily than another? Part of it could be that just the, the composition of the foods they're eating and their inherent differences in insulin sensitivity. Insulin resistance is genetic where some people will just be more insulin resistant than other people. So those people that are more insulin resistant naturally, they will have to fight harder. Their insulin is going to want to be higher all the time. And so it'll be a harder fight for them to keep it low, but they can do it. And, and, and once again, the truth of the situation is it's not their metabolic rate. It's really this, what fuel, the sentiment of what fuel are you burning? If insulin is high, you're burning sugar, you're not burning fat, and the insulin is going to stimulate the fat cells to grow and store energy rather than break things down.